Yeah, no one left behind, right. Open your Bible, Bibles, please, to Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1, we're going to go back and read, beginning in verse 5 briefly, but Titus chapter 1, and, uh, and uh, we forgot to mention, didn't we, that uh, we just have a, a new baby here for the first time, and I, I'm, I apologize for that. So uh, g- give her a wave back there. Yeah, all right, there. All right, there she is, yeah. going to step out for the moment, though. Yeah, great. All right. Titus chapter chapter 1 is where we'll be looking here, and one of the first things we're, we're going to see is uh, we're going to see a warning about myths. And i got to be careful I say that because, I, as I noted in the email that I sent out, that uh, as I gave this title to Sherry, she I said truth or myths, and she thought I said truth or myths. And so that's why it's different in your bulletin than it is on your, on your sermon title. But uh, it's easy to, easy to do something like that, isn't it? And when it comes to myths, one of the first things I thought of is Greek mythology. How many, uh, how many of you know some names of uh, Greek, Greek gods in mythology? Notice small. Yeah, say, shout, shout one out. Go ahead. Uh, yep. Okay. All right. Yeah, okay. All right, <laughs> yeah, we could probably go on and on, on and on. And it's, it's kind of interesting that, uh, that uh, maybe you learned them, did you learn them in school? Yeah, yeah okay. Uh, did you learn Bible in school? Oh, if you went to a Christian school, hopefully you did. But uh, it's interesting, the scholars today say we ought to know about Greek mythology and those Greek gods because they teach bravery intelligence, family, right and wrong. All things that you ought to be able to find right in the Scripture, you find all of that and much more in Scripture, in, in, and it's not myth, it's true. And uh, so when we emphasize today, we are going to emphasize truth, where, where we, and it is, truth is God's, God's truth, and all truth comes from God, is based on God, not on myths. And when you read the scriptures, you find God's truth expressed in the lives of real people. And in fact, when you look in the scripture, you find God's truth even about people who falter and fail. Somewhat similar to some Greek mythology, but we find that but we always come back to the fact that God is the center, God is the truth that we need to know and understand uh, rather than, uh, well, this is, this is a fable, this is a myth. Now we come back to God's truth and these are real people like brave David who faced Goliath. Talk about bravery. Or like, like someone with a, with, uh, a family like Abraham who waited 25 years to begin his family that God had promised. Or, and then you have all sorts of things within the scripture, and of course, right and wrong. What do myths have with right and wrong? You know, well, it might be, and we're going to talk about some of those things today. Paul's audience was probably very familiar with the idea of, of uh, both Greek and Roman mythology, and they become kind of uh, mixed here. And I almost thought I heard a Roman, I heard you guys mention a Roman God, but I'm not sure. You know, there's different, uh, and by the way, when I say God there, it's small g. It's a myth. It's a mythological God, all right? But, uh, you know, when we, when Paul wrote, and he's, in in this context, we're going to see he's going to emphasize truth. He's going to emphasize what's true as opposed to myths is going to be one of the first things that we look at. And, you know, there's confusion when it comes to truth today. I read, I read that, uh, that a 12-year-old boy in 22, because of the myth of Superman, I know I might get some hits on that from some of you sci-fi guys, but uh, he, he, he was killed trying to fly like Superman. You know, what does he need? What does somebody like that need? He needs to hear the truth. He, 
<laughs> these phones. <laughs> so for our audience elsewhere, that was a phone that went off. It was not, <laughs> it was not a problem with the internet. All right. Uh, anyway, uh, but what did that boy need to hear? That boy needed to hear the truth about gravity, that God established gravity a long time ago. And uh, he needed to hear that truth. He needed to hear other truths that, that solid bones don't fly and other biological truths that boys can't fly or men can't fly or whatever uh, without some apparatus. And, uh, you know, most of us would understand that. And yet today, today, when a girl thinks she wants to be a boy, what, do, what does our society do? They want to change her body rather than her mind. They want to give her something other than truth. And we're in a mixed up world today. So when we look at some of these things that we're going to look at today, this is not, this is not way out there. This is not way back there. This is even today. And, uh, and so our text is going to emphasize that the, there's, a, there's a, a contrast between a confused mind and the truth that we're going to see that kind of thing. Sound doctrine is where we're going to have an emphasis today. And let me just give you a little thought here. When we talk about sound doctrine, it'll go well with what Megan shared about, about camp and the gospel and what we shared yesterday at the gospel. But do you realize in, the, in about, it took us about a minute, didn't it, to dismiss junior church? Do you realize in that time about 70 people went to hell, died and went to hell? in that minute. I'm, we're going on averages there. Stop and think about that. About 70 people. And in the, in the hour plus that we're going to be here, more than 4,500 people are going to enter eternity and, and, and be in hell. Isn't that sobering? When you stop and think about that? And that's being gracious that's being gracious with, to allow for 30% that claim to be Christian. 30% of the, the world kind of claims to be Christian, but man, when we, when we heard some of the, the responses yesterday when it came to the gospel, you know, that, uh, that someone would say, uh, I, I was sharing with someone and, and Dave encountered the same thing, and uh, we're sharing the truth of the gospel. And, uh, you know, are you going to heaven? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and, and grandma or mom would interrupt and say, yeah, well, tell them what happened. Well, I was baptized. Gulp. And I know I ran across one group of people that literally said, that literally claimed that their baptism was what saved them. You know, and I kept trying to bring it back to Christ. You ran across the same thing. And I think it's being very, it's very common today and becoming pretty prevalent today that people say it's, it's Christ plus your water, your works or your baptism or something like that. Truth or myth? Even though they draw it out of the scripture, it's myth. Because the truth of the gospel today, and Megan read it, but I'm going to just give you an emphasis again, the gospel, like our, like our, our uh, symbol here, Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. It's trusting that truth that saves. And uh, uh, I, I, was, I, was, I was often, I was often, as I talked about trust with the kids, I would say, all right, and, you know, half of them, they couldn't reach the floor with their, with their uh, feet anyway, but I, I'd lift up my feet. I'm trusting this chair. I'm trusting this chair. You know, you didn't come in here and, oh, I don't know if this pew is going to hold me. Well, the other people. No, <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't go in and try to inspect the pew to see if it would hold you. You just trusted the chair. You just sat down. Will you sit down in the arms of Jesus? Trust the Lord Jesus Christ who died on the cross, paid the penalty for your sin. When it said Christ dies for our sins, it begs the question, who's got sin? All of us. Who needs help? All of us. We need a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is not the law, Romans 3.28. It is not works, Romans 4.5. 4, it is Christ and Christ alone. 
who gives us the gift of, of salvation. So let's come to our context with that in mind. I want to go back to verse 5 because I want, to, I want to get the basis here for what's going on. Here's why this letter was written. Here's what Titus was to be about. For this reason I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. And so that's the setting. Titus was commanded to appoint elders. Where was he going to get them? He was going to get them right from the, from the people in the pew, shall I say, because all of us ought to have these types of characteristics in our lives. These are characteristics for every believer, and that's what we did when we go from 6, 7, 8, uh, and, and into 9. Pick up in verse 9 with me. This is the last characteristic he said he ought to, we ought to be looking for when we look for overseers or elders, but it ought to be what all of us are. We ought to all be holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine... So notice, the faithful word, sound doctrine, both to exhort and convict those who contradict. Aha, uh -huh. and that leads us into what's coming up here because you have, you have, uh, you got to have hold to the truth, hold to sound doctrine because in verses 10 and 11, there are many that are not. For there are many insubordinate, both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision. You'd think the Jews would have embraced, their, embraced the Christ, right? He said, especially those guys whose mouths must be stopped. I yelled shut up here a few weeks ago, didn't I, on that? That's the idea. Who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. One of them, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. Huh. Lie, truth. Myth, truth. Where are you? Anyway, uh, notice, this testimony is true, verse 13. Therefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. Do you, you see a pattern? Sound doctrine, sound in the faith. The faithful word. There are just several times he just keeps coming back to that. And then as we get to verse 14, our text, not giving heed... And so what we're going to see today is, is an emphasis, if you have sound doctrine, what does that look like? And I'm going to give you 12 things. Yes, that breaks every rule of preaching a sermon. 12 things. And we're going to go through some of them very quickly. But he says, he says not giving heed, number one, to Jewish fables. That's the word for myths in the Greek. And commandments of men who turn from the truth. Ah, here's another word. Sound doctrine, truth. To the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, but even their mind and conscience are defiled. They profess to know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. And so we have a loaded, a loaded passage here uh, with these things, but we've gotten, a, we've gotten a sense of the background of this just in the reading. I've kind of tied the reading with the background there that, that we have. And uh, the point is, what does it mean to be sound in the faith? What does it mean to, be, to have sound doctrine? That's the goal, is that you are sound in the faith and that you could pass on what it means to be sound in the faith. But first of all, he's going to show us what that does not mean. It does not mean giving heed to Jewish fables, number one. Jewish myths, not the truth. Myth, not truth. And we could say that all through this whole thing today. Myth, not truth. Myth, not truth. And uh, from the context of the way Paul used this word myths in his writings, he really is emphasizing anything that is contrary to the message of grace that he received from God. And that's an important thought to keep in mind. And in uh, Titus or in First Timothy chapter one and verse four, uh, he he shows that it takes away from the message today. Myths detract from God's message today. I'm going to read from the ESV just for simplicity here. But he says, "Don't teach any other doctrines." Verse three, 
nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God. What's the stewardship from God? It's the dispensation from God. Anyway, he also warned, warned in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 4 don't, about turning from the word and sound doctrine to myths. So you have that word myth coming up several times in Paul's usage. And in connection, it's, 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 it's the opposite of God's revelation given to, given to Paul that he's supposed to share with us Gentiles today. When he talks about Jewish myths here, uh, Paul warned the Romans that the Jews were enemies of the gospel. Now, I'm not trying to emphasize some kind of anti-Semitism here. That's not Paul's point in the context. The point is, is that the Jews of his day, they were always attacking what Paul was proclaiming. It was the Jews that brought it up in Acts chapter 15 and verse 1 that yeah, you can believe in Christ, but you got to be sac- you got to be circumcised to be saved. What is that? It was legalism. The Jews couldn't let go and chances are they weren't they weren't true believers in Christ or they 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 just kept hanging on to these religious type things. Do we have religious people hanging on to religious things today? Oh, you better believe it. Are they confusing the gospel today? You better believe they are. And uh it was the Jews that, were, that brought up lies, really, and myths are really lies. It was the Jews that brought up lies when Paul was arrested in Acts chapter 21. They said, oh yeah, he's teaching things contrary to the law. That's what they were saying. And guess what? He even brought Gentiles into the, into the synagogue. Oh my. He even brought Gentiles. Well, no wonder everybody, everybody was in an uproar there. Because as James had pointed out to Paul a little bit earlier, look at all the, these people who are zealous for the law. And that, that's where the Jews were, zealous for. And Paul, Paul puts the law in that context in the category of myths. It was a myth because they were using it contrary to the will of God. Number two, don't give heed. If you want to be sound in the faith, don't give heed to commands of men, commands of men. And these two myth, the Jewish myth and the commands of men are, are tied together. And Jesus even pointed this out in, math, in Mark chapter 7, verses 6 and 7. He said they were, they were hypocrites because they were teaching the commands of men as doctrines. It was the commands of men. What were the Jews doing? Well, they were making up laws that went beyond the law. They were making up laws that went beyond the law. And Jesus said, you guys are adding. And you'll have to go back and read Mark 7, but it was about washing hands. And that's what Jesus commanded. He said, "These you guys are in the commands of men. In other words, legalism, religious legalism. In Colossians chapter 2 and verse 22, Paul warned about legalism and he called it the commands of men, the commandments of men. And so you have that, kind of, that same kind of theme going through scripture. When you add to what God's word has to say, you're, it becomes just a commandment or doctrine of men. And, you know, religions today, ignorantly probably, I'm giving a benefit of the doubt, but they ignorantly use the scriptures to promote legalism because they fail to recognize we're under grace, not law. We have liberty. We're not under bondage. It's faith, not works. It's Paul, not Moses. And we could just go on and on and on. But but the... Religions today fail to come back to the Word of God and get to what the Word of God has to say. And uh, notice the last phrase in there, and maybe you could say this isn't really an extra one, but I put it in there. They turn away from the truth. The commandments of men, the Jewish fables, they turn away from the truth. But I think we need to come back to that idea of truth and recognize that, that around in Paul's day and in our day, there is a turning away from the truth 
with these kinds of things and more. In John 8, 44, Satan is a liar and the father of lies. Huh. Do you remember we just read in, in Titus here in verse 12, one of their prophets, their own said, Cretans are always liars. And Paul says, yeah, that's true. That's true. Here he's writing to these guys to say, you're a bunch of liars. Wouldn't that go over good? win friends and influence people. You know, you're a bunch of liars here. But he, he just, he, he hammered them there. And uh, I think Americans are swift to lie today. We're swift to hear, and we hear a lot of lies. And, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, um, you know I was for issue one and it failed. Okay. All right. I'm not, I'm not arguing, but when you, if you listen carefully to a lot of the ads that were out there against issue one, there were lie after lie after lie. It's just interesting. Uh, is that okay in politics? You know, is that okay? Not for the believer. You know, or when we come to, uh, well, we're just learning there's been a lot of lies in the Hunter Joe uh, scandal that's coming up. There were lies about the Russian collusion that are finally becoming clear now. Uh, there were, uh, th we were fed a lot of lies about COVID. Doesn't mean, you know, we just had a prayer request about people with COVID. I mean, it's a real thing. But the lie of, uh, there were lies, China was denying it came from them at first. And, you know, the, the lies. And then our own government joined in the bandwagon anyway. But we're constantly hearing lies. We're hearing lies about gender today, trying to get in your mind, young people, about gender. And it, when God says there's two, uh, and then uh, uh, the schools have taught lies about creation for decades now. And you know, lies have consequences. Lies have consequences. Just think of the, just think of the lies that have that have been associated with abortion, that it's, an, uh, that it's a, just a fetus, not a life. Just think of the, I can't remember the number there, how many millions of Americans that are dead because of that lie. And you could go on, and now we're embracing the lie of uh, euthanasia for the old and the sick. And certain states are embracing that. Uh, thankfully, more thankfully, it's not as as prominent in Ohio, but uh, wouldn't take much for a constitutional change these days. Enough said. The big lie. You know what the big lie is? The truth is relative. Truth is relative. That's been out there for a long time, and that has effect, that has affected even us. It has affected even us. I know we need a swift kick in the rear, but it has impacted us. The tru that truth is relative. But have you ever had someone tell you something like that? If someone ever tells you that, well, when someone says your truth and my truth, that kind of, you know, that's, that's saying truth is relative. Probably the best way to ask them is, well, is that really true? puts them in a box, doesn't it? Is that really true, that truth is relative? What do the scriptures say? Jesus is the truth. The way, the truth, and the life. The truth. So any turning away from truth is a turning away from Jesus. It's a turning away from God. And we need to call it like it is. I've given you a quote in your bulletin, but I or in your notes there, I have it a little longer, and I'm going to read it here. This is from gotquestions.org, and it says, The Greek word for truth, aletheia, uh, which refers to divine revelation. Get that? Truth comes from God. That's what they're saying. Truth refers, the Greek word for truth emphasizes that it's God's truth. God is the source. And it's re and it going on in the quote. And it's related to a word that literally means what can't be hidden. It conveys the thought that truth is always there, always open, and available for all to see, with nothing being hidden or obscured. 
The Hebrew word for truth means firmness, constancy, duration. Such a def definition implies an everlasting substance and something that can be relied upon. Truth from God, trustworthy. So let me ask you a couple of questions. Feel free to speak out the answer. Is John 1, 4, 1, 1 through 14 and Titus 2, 14 true when it says Jesus is God? Is John 14, 6 true that Jesus is the truth? Is John 1, 3 and Colossians 1, 15 to 17 true that Jesus is the creator? Is Galatians 4, 4 and Romans 13, 8, 15, 8 true that Jesus ministered under law, not grace? Oh, you weren't very bold there. <laughs> yes, it is true. Uh, you know, but in the, in the world around us? Uh, bah, 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 you know, anyway. Uh, is, is it true in Galatians 1? Uh, oh, wait, I skipped one. Is it true, Romans 6, 14 and 15, that we are under grace, not law? Good, thanks for getting back on track here. Uh, in Galatians 1, 11 and 12, is it true that Jesus gave Paul this revelation of grace? Is Ephesians 3, 5 to 7 true that the body of Christ is only in Paul's letters? Is Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 true that salvation today is only by grace through faith in Christ's death? Are these things absolutely true? Yes. Do you believe those things? Yes. Are you applying those things? Well, maybe not perfectly, are we? But even nice people will tell you that Jesus is not God. I got, I got a good friend. From the, from the gathering down the road here. He will deny that Jesus is God. It might be people who use the word of God to, to tell you need baptism to be saved. It might be someone who seems wise to emphasize that evolution was used to create. Those who, there are, there are those who will boldly say, the church began at Pentecost. The confused are going to say, oh, you find the body of Christ all throughout Scripture. The lost will claim that, it's, that salvation is faith plus something you do. Think about it. It doesn't mean that they're purposely doing this. Sometimes it's ignorance. But sometimes it is. It's holding the commands of men rather than the truth of God. They're leaning on fables rather than truth. And it demonstrates the need for us to be wise, to be humble, to be lovingly bold when it comes to, when it comes to speaking the truth. Speaking the truth. Truth is God's and it needs to be, it needs to be spoken as God's word. So we focus on the word of God as we preach and as we proclaim. The fourth thing, verse 15, pure. All things are pure, all things are pure to the pure. Uh, who are, that's people who are in line with sound doctrine. That's people that are saved. But, you know, most of these people that we're going to talk about or most of these situations we're talking about, these are actions of the unsaved, those that don't believe the gospel. But pure means clean, and uh, it, it, might even, it might even be borrowed from the idea that it's clean according to the law. That doesn't mean Paul's trying to put us under law, but he's, he's borrowing those words to maybe get their attention for those that are falling for the fables of, of legalism, the Jewish fables of legalism. Because of grace, if you believe the gospel... You are pure. You are clean. Your slate is clean because of Jesus Christ. Your slate is clean. You are pure, if you wish, uh, because of Jesus Christ. Because he paid the penalty. And there's more that we could discuss on that, but we are 
positionally clean and washed free from the law. Number five, not impure or defiled. Notice he kind of ties those together there. And the idea of impure uh, uh, or defiled is the idea to die or stain or defile or pollute. So it stinky. Not unbelieving, number six. It's no faith, no faith, no faithfulness. In other words, they're not to be trusted because they don't trust God. To be sound means that you are believing, that you are, that you are trusting, that you are faithful. But when you miss it, when you're not sound, this is where you are. And you're tied up with fables. And it, it, just, it just confirms in, the, in my mind here when he says they're not believing. It just pr- confirms the depravity of man. The unsaved man, the unsaved man has no good within him. No good, not at all. That's why Paul concludes in Romans 3, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Interesting, yesterday as I, as I began my presentation, I, I like to use a glove with the colors on it and uh, talked about the purity and the cleanness and the, the, just the perfectness of heaven with my thumb, and the yellow. And uh, then I brought out sin. And I, uh, I tried to be gentle in saying it, but a mom that was sitting there grabbed her child and said, we got to go. I don't know if she believed a fab- fable or if she just was hungry for something other than the Word of God. I don't know. But it appeared to me when I mentioned S-I-N, she was gone. I think, there's, I think our world around us doesn't believe that we're sinful, that man is sinful and needs a Savior. Number seven, no defiled mind. Ephesians, 3, or Ephesians 2, 1 to 3 confirms that every unbeliever is dead in trespasses and sin. They are controlled by Satan, they, and they fulfill his desires in the flesh and in the mind. Satan controls the flesh and the mind. And there's no soundness of mind. See, we want the sound, healthy mind rather than the unsound sound mind of the unbelieving. Number eight, no defiled conscience. Wow. Good old Jiminy Cricket used to tell us, let your conscience be, the, be your guide. You know, that cartoon type. But we can't let conscience guide unless it's with sound doctrine. The conscience can be trained and directed, and it can be seared, according to 1 Timothy chapter 4, seared with a hot iron. And in other words, sound doctrine can be burned right out of your mind. It can be burned right out of your conscience. And legalism can take over. The commands of men can take over. Grace gives us a pure conscience. Number nine, genuine profession. Here I used a positive here. Uh, just emphasizing in verse 16 here, they profess, they confess to know God. Those, to be sound-minded, you need a, you need a pure, pure profession, a pure confession about the gospel, etc. And uh, in the context here, their, their works deny that. If you're a Christian and you have a confession, that you know Jesus Christ as Savior, your life ought to back it up. Enough said. Sound doctrine says you ought to live for him who died for you. Number 10, not abominable. I wanted to say snowman, but, uh, uh, but abominable, it's foul and detestable. Another stinky word, if you wish. And in fact, in Revelation, and this, this convinces me that this is unbelievers, this is the act of an unbeliever. He says, but the cowardly, unbelieving, and abominable murderers, sexual, immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire which burns, lake with, which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. He's talking in the context about unbelievers. Don't let your life fall into that category. Number 11, not disobedient. 
sound doctrines. Those who are aligned with sound doctrine are obedient, not disobedient. And uh, the root, the root of this word, I I enjoy. Uh, it's it's the the word is persuade. It's the root of the word faith. Uh, when you when you but they're they're unpersuaded to the fact that they're completely disobedient. And in my mind, I tied it with Romans chapter one, and uh, the context there. They believe the lies, believing the lie. They suppress the truth because they're not persuaded. They suppress the truth in unrighteousness, and then they they go along with the lies of creation, the lies about God, the lies about self, the lies about truth, the lies about sexuality, the lies about judgment in that context. And then the last one, not disqualified. This The, the Greek word there has the idea that you're put to the test and you fail. That's the idea, not disqualified in relation to good works. And uh, the bottom line is that good works, sound doctrine teaches that good works have to be defined by God and they have to be produced by God. It's allowing God to work in us to produce what he says. It reminds me of Titus 1, 2, 14 that we've been quoting every week that we are God's special people purchased for his purpose of good works. That is God's design for us. That's what sound doctrine teaches. The opposite is you fail the test. You don't back up what you say you are. You're hypocritical. The bottom line is that we need to be true. We need to be true to God's message. We need to be true to his purpose. We need to be true to God. There's no room for fables in the Christian life. There's room for truth. Let it show in your life. and Let God be the glory. Get the glory. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. And and, uh, we we know this list was long. And we, we just thank you, Father, that there's encouragement in our hearts, in our lives, from your word to be sound, to be healthy in our in our teaching in our what we believe that we may glorify you with our lives we praise you and